Namaste dear viewers a very warm welcome to Go Vegan Veganism a philosophy that embraces humanity and a culture that embraces compassion so what's in store for us today's episode of Go Vegan all this and more we'll get to know from animal activist and vegan himself Mr Arvind Kannan let's welcome him to the show Namaste Arvind welcome to the show Namaste thank you uh, Arvind it's such a pleasure to know about veganism and the concept itself is so beautiful but having known veganism through the eyes of animals and mm -hmm. what they feel the pain all the animals okay in the sense with all the theory and the practicals and the pictures what mm -hmm. we see and the videos what we see but then um veganism also extends till the level of insects right. so you're so anti insect that is killing of insects is not something what veganism promotes right. why is that so uh in i, I want to just elaborate a bit on that that is first about the killing of insects that is a uh, as we've discussed many times earlier we have learned that it is impossible to live a life where we don't harm anyone like like in our day to day life we might actually step on an ant or some insect we might also hit mosquitoes when they bite us so i would say that a complete ahimsa life where we don't kill any insect is definitely not possible that is first of all out of the picture no way we can do such a life but i do want to talk about the exploitation of insects because okay. when we say killing it's not just the killing it's the fact that once again humans are using insects for certain things and you have said the point that um we understand when we see images of cows suffering or a goat crying before it's going to be killed that hurts us we see chickens. it yeah chickens they scream they, they bleed just like us yes but insects they don't even have vocal cords they look they resemble nothing like us they are nothing like mammals or reptiles or any other species so that's so primitive in their structure exactly but the weird thing is that these insects do have a brain and a nervous system but they are not like what we have they are called um They rudimentary the rudimentary but they don't have a backbone and that word for that okay. is invertebrate yes yes they're invertebrate so they do have a rudimentary brain and nervous system not as complex as ours so the question then becomes because veganism we always say we should not exploit any sentient you know they keep using the word sentient exactly. and sentient sentient means one who can feel pain and suffering so people will now ask can insects feel pain and suffering mm -hmm. well number one we know they can't scream or shout because they the only noise they make is when they rub their wings together at night and they make this screeching noise screeching noises, chirping yes. noise that's the only noise they can make they don't make or buzzing noise bees make they do not exactly have vocal cords to scream and if you look at in a scientific aspect the science itself is not clear on this it's a gray area scientists will not openly say that insects feel pain some will say they do feel something like pain others will say no they don't feel any pain so i cannot give a definitive answer on this for example have you heard of a word called nociception No, no no okay so the audience also may not have heard of this no perception is similar to pain we have two kinds of pain receptors in the body that is no perceptor pains and neurological pathway pain okay. that is for example let's just say someone punches me or hits me very hard my arm starts to ache so i will immediately grab my arm and try to caress it and make it feel better that is the neurological pain okay whereas when you when your body approaches something hot and you touch it as a reflex action you immediately pull your hand back okay. if someone were to throw chili powder on my eyes you notice that i will not first it will not first fall into my eyes wait for that it to hurt reflex. so i immediately close my eyes yes. and somebody does that this happens that's a reflex these are no receptor kind of reactions and these okay. no receptors exist in insects okay they then, do that that is but that is not exactly pain that is just an immediate response to a threat outside Okay that's okay that. just that adrenaline yeah, rush the, the, the reflex action is what we call it. that is present but that doesn't constitute a pain so are insects sentient is a question i cannot definitively answer because science itself cannot answer but i will say one thing if you look at it practically in a day to day life insects most definitely like all other creatures including us and everyone watching this want to live that is something for example even as it's a cockroach in your house if you've ever tried hitting it it does not stand in one place and wait for the chapel to come and fall on it it will move search for that one gap in that kitchen area to run into True. which shows that these creatures although rudimentary want to live first yes. point second thing is they do think they do very much respond unlike plants they actually respond to their surroundings True. and stimuli and they move and take part in the world and they clearly have a desire to live and stay away from what we could call as pain So in that regard I think if we can avoid harming them why not hmm. like we already spoken about the fact that when mosquitoes bite us they harm us yes. we hit them now when we're walking on the road accidentally we might um step on and if there's an infestation of let's say 10000 cockroaches in your house you might have to take some fumigation action so those things are somewhat understandable why we do it but let's say if we can avoid exploitation of insects that is mainly two things honey 
and silk is where we intentionally once again put them in cages start breed exploiting them, them breed them over once feed them, over feed them once them. again start doing the same thing we always do i am just saying let's at least stop the exploitation of insects in the form of honey and silk because it's actually possible to do so okay okay so this is actually where we should all actually put our brains into work exactly because, because they are also living yeah, they they, they, they are living and the the point is that make a difference where you can make a difference <laughs> we just because you can't be 100% perfect doesn't mean you should not strive see the thing is that exploitation is intentional violence okay that happens intentional for a pure selfish reason exploitation the word yes, itself yes. so we when we we can at least stop that so when I, we are driven by selfish motive to get something out of that yes, thing, then yes, it is a problem exactly. then it's so, an exploitation so that is where i think we can stop and we have to draw a line at that other things apart from that they are a gray area in life that's just how life works i guess mm-hmm. so. so until unless the insects are like pests yeah only then right. we can take an action Obvi- otherwise obviously. we should just allow them to allow live the them way to they live want. i would say if there's a cockroach in my house i'll catch it and put it outside that's it one i can do five i can do 50000 i cannot so we so, obviously draw a line somewhere so we should know when it is when an insect yeah. is a pest <laughs> yes exactly so okay so what about you mentioned about honey mm-hmm. so we all know how honey is produced right. with honey bee so they uh, accumulate all the nectar the right. sap they build a house they build a hive right so that is how they accumulate honey right. um definitely i agree that it is an intentional motive between right. uh, behind that so uh, how do you say that we should stop this stop. okay first uh, i want to say that although we understand that uh, honey comes from honey bees we many of us actually don't understand the exact process about how honey is made and uh-huh. number 2 is we also don't realize how complex these honey bees are and i think we have to just take a moment to sit back and just chat and talk about how these honey bees exist okay. if you look at a hive you will notice that there are three groups of bees in there there is first the queen bee mm-hmm. she is the one who will always be laying eggs her only job in life is to literally create offspring that's all she does and then there are the male bees these male bees the only job for them is to mate with the queen once they have mated with the queen once they die they die yes that's their only purpose in life hmm. and last is the female worker bees these are the most popular ones and these bees depending on their age they will actually segregate the work amongst them mm-hmm. and some will the elderly ones will stay in the hive they'll take care of the young ones others will fly outside to get nectar from and pollen grains from the flowers others will probably be taking care of the queen bee others will be guarding the hive so they have a complete hierarchy hierarchy and social structure among them and they abide and work by it diligently wow. this is what these bees do now to understand how these bees are born what happening is if you notice these bee hive they are in small hexagonal layers yes so what's happening is this queen bee she will lay a single egg in every single hexagon and when time comes they will hatch into a larva for those who don't know most insects have three stages larva pupa, pupa. and the insect stage yes so what's happening is when she lays these eggs the other female worker bees are going to go and take care of the eggs now there will be one particular hexagon marked in that hive and whichever larva is born there she will be the next queen bee Okay. if it is a she if when it's born as a she so what happens is these larva are fed something called royal jelly mm-hmm. and this is secreted by the glands present on the top of a female worker bee and that's what they give us some food and they also feed them honey as food obviously and this is what they eat and they keep feeding this to that one larva that's supposed to be the next queen bee and she is given all the food she needs and she ends up transforming into the next queen bee and she takes over the hive mm-hmm. so that's how it's working this is yeah. very interesting and that's how they work and they work on this perfectly uh and these bees also so one thing people have to understand is many of us actually assume that when bees fly to a flower what they suck and remove out of that flower is honey people actually have a notion that that's we know it's called nectar, nectar it's it's, it's yes. not it's not honey so ha, these bees will fly actually even sometimes hundreds of kilometers away to go and find just one small flower suck whatever they can and then they'll fly back all the way to their hive and this is how honey is made by the way people might find this disgusting but i think you may know how honey is actually yes, made so yes. these bees will swallow this nectar and they will then spit it into the mouth of another bee which will then again swallow and they'll keep doing this back and forth till finally the enzymes in their stomach mix nicely with the nectar and it's finally spat out on the hexagon in the hive and that is honey okay so honey just the salivary it is the bee mass. vomit it is bee vomit literally yeah. but <laughs> if we say we want to buy bee vomit it's not nice so we say we want gross. to buy it's gross <laughs> we want to buy honey so but i'm not saying this to gross somebody else but that's in reality that is what honey is people may not know this it's actually literally bee vomit so people now say that okay they do make honey but they make honey in excess 
Mm-hmm. Like we say that, right? Like, why do they? Why do these bees need all this honey? We can take some. Let them take some. As if the bees are saying, "Yes, yes, come, we'll share." Like, but we, that's what we say. So what's happening is you have to understand honey is used to them as a few things. Number one, it's the principal food. That's mm-hmm. the main thing they eat. Number two, it is used to keep the hive warm. Warm. So uh, when during winter times when it's really cold or during rainy times when they can't go out and fly, that's their food. That's their insulation. So that's the reserve. That's their reserve. That is everything for them. Their honey is everything. That that's the only thing they live for, literally. Mm-hmm. And then that honey, when they eat it, it's also used to produce the wax. in which they used to build their hives exactly so they literally survive off of the honey they work for their honey that honey is everything for them mm-hmm. so that's how a bee hive works in nature now humans obviously have seen that understood clearly what's going on noted down every single point mm. now how do we bring this to our place and start using them to make some money and have honey so now we have built these artifacts it's called an apiary have you heard of it yes yes uh, rearing of bees is, is called ap- apiary apiculture i believe so what's happening is we keep these um these hexagonal shaped sheets we have them Hives, and we close yeah. them and we put the bees in them and have a few gaps so they fly outside they can fill it with honey and then when we when those workers are working they don't open that shed and like okay is there any bee over there is it going to get squashed we can slowly remove and take they can't do that they are told within 1 hour your productivity is i want to do extract some 10 liters of honey that's your job you open take and they have these sprays mm-hmm. where they spray smoke on the bees mm. now when they spray just smoke just to get them the off yeah okay if people were extracting honey from a hive in the forest they burn it we seen that yes yes and that we agree is killing the bees the so smoke does not kill the bees they, they it disorients them it drives them into a panic mode because what happens is these creatures are very sensitive and they think that when smoke comes their hive is on fire they think okay. their hive is under attack and when this happens what they do is they immediately begin quickly drinking all the honey because what they're thinking right now is my hive right now is on fire so let us save whatever the whatever reserve. i can i'll swallow right now and use that to make wax to build our new house oh. that's their mindset the moment you smoke you see not everyone will leave they immediately will go to the honey start sucking if you again keep smoking them they're obviously going to leave many bees get disoriented they get smushed they get squashed but the point is this again if even if let's say not even one bee dies there the whole idea that bees make honey for us is silly to me mm-hmm. because bees make honey for their offspring and for their survival and once again as i said you are that bee probably flies hundreds of kilometers to take one small bit of honey you take that honey it will think oh my god my hive is going to die again it will go fly and come back for you like if that is not the definition of the word exploitation i would like to hear what is the definition of sure. the word exploitation because that is literally what we are doing to them and you might ask right now if this is going to happen on a regular basis why don't these bees just fly away and build another colony like they are not foolish creatures they are very smart and the question is they would in the wild as i told you if a hive is on fire the qu- they'll first make sure the queen bee comes out they'll all come out and they'll build a new house here what's happening is the queen bee the moment they take a queen bee in an apiary they will cut off her wings and they'll cut off her legs oh she is just dropped there into the hive and as long as the queen bee remains there the rest of them will not move so we have clearly made it in such a way that even if these worker bees want to move they cannot because the queen can't move so the it's queen is stuck there manipulated yeah it is manipulated again as i told we have noted exactly how they work not to learn about them not to appreciate them to take advantage of that true we know how they function and how they work now if you did not know you can actually buy queen bees online oh my goodness you can actually write a mail to certain people who are breeding bees and say like i want a bee you know in a matchbox they will send you a queen bee already with legs and wings cut off oh you can start your own apiary so sad it's a business i know how now it's so commercial yeah it is it's commercial and the thing is that this is how we are extracting honey on a large scale if you look mm-hmm. at this huge company extracting honey this is how it's done but again even this is not the case my whole point was we shouldn't be exploiting them we shouldn't be using them at all let's try to know more on silk but after a short commercial break So I've been whether it is the structure of the beehive or bees by nature how mm. they live and they actually literally live in the place where they strive for living right. so it's becomes none of our right to take that away from them right. so we should definitely not manipulate them neither exploit them Correct. neither do anything that harms them and Correct. their living Correct. um 
so whether it is even the signaling or the pheromone or the way they just structure in that hierarchy it's so beautiful so right, it right. makes that we have really literally no right to harm them at Correct. all uh, this is about the honey aspect mm. of it what about the silk because even in silk mm. we raise the mulberry worms the silk right, worms right. and end up killing them Correct. So, uh, what do you say? What so, does vegan say? Sure, I'd say even honey is something that people can probably quit immediately. They'll be like, not a, too, not a big difficult thing. But silk is literally, like let's just say, so deep into our culture and our roots. Like, instead, be it a, a good day, a, a day of festivities, or even a bad day, silk has to be worn. That's how much we wear silk. But I'll tell you one interesting thing. Sericulture, which is a production of silk, is actually not an Indian culture. It never mm -hmm. started in India. It originated in China. China, yes. And from China, it went to Korea and Japan and then came to India. So mm -hmm. we people think that it's part of our culture. It's, it's, it's not our culture, first of all. It, sericulture is Chinese. It's not even part of our um, our own creation. So like you said, we the we use mulberry worm. So people who don't know, we a silk worm eats mulberry leaves. Just by a silk produced by it is called mulberry silk. And um, it'll keep eating this and then it'll form a cocoon around yes. itself. Uh -huh. by shooting a long thread and this thread is what we call as silk yes and then finally from it it'll break from the cocoon and come as a moth a silk moth and then this is the life cycle of a silkworm now so the silkworm most commonly used for production of silk is known as the bombyx mori that's the species we use and this is actually a selective bred species of a wild species of silkworms called bombyx mandarina now what's happened is humans have selectively bred the species to such an extent mm -hmm. that when this worm turns into a moth, it'll actually have a lot of problems with its body. For example, it'll have wings, but it cannot fly because its body is too large. Okay. It'll actually have a mouth that does not function, which means it cannot even eat food. Okay. So once the silkworm becomes a moth, even if it is not killed, it'll die within a few days. It can't eat, can't fly, can't move, can't escape from predators because it's a completely unnatural breed. Like how we say these broiler chickens exist, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. our cows these days are born with these huge udders. udders. That's because we have selectively bred them that way. To be, mm -hmm. They have no choice but to exist like that. So that's the suffering that these moths go through. Now, if we have to look at how the silk industry works, you see, it all becomes... Be you see, it all begins with the silk breeders. What they do is, we have people who breed these silk moths and then they'll capture all these eggs mm. and they'll sell these eggs. These eggs are then taken in by the silk farmers. Now, they'll place these eggs on trays which contain mulberry leaves and they'll place them in sheds. And soon the worms hatch, they'll start eating all the leaves and then they'll turn into cocoons. Mm. The worms which cannot turn into cocoons on, on time are killed or thrown out. That's what happens to them. Now, after that, these cocoons are then sold in the cocoon market, a se separate market for this. The silk industry goes and buys the cocoons from that and then they throw the cocoons into boiling hot water with the worms still inside. And mm -hmm. so the worms die. So this is where the question again comes like, okay, does the worm feel pain? Well, if you ask me, it's kind of like a silly question because um, you're throwing a living creature into boiling water Obviously and asking... Suffer. Is this cruelty? Like, I, 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 I don't have an answer. I, I don't know what to say. Yes, it's of absurd. course, it's, it's absurd, the question. So, and I know people are going to say, it's just a worm, man. Like, why is such a big, there's so many problems in the country. Look, I'm not asking you to sit and cry for the worms or do any of that. I know for a fact that we cannot connect to a worm like how we connect to a dog or another human being. But that doesn't justify us exploiting them needlessly. Because again, silk is a fashion statement. It's about showing our status. Yes. Right. Yes, oh, I wear symbol. a silk side that's like 10,000 rupees. Yeah, that's what it is. So, for that, doing this seems completely wrong in, in, in my perception. So, once the silk industries buy these cocoons, they boil them alive, those worms die, and then they pull out the silk from it and mm. one single thread. And then they weave the threads out and they give that to the weavers who are next in line who will purchase the silk and they will turn it into clothes. Those clothes are then brought into the retail and then we buy it. It's a huge, long process. Comes from the egg to what you're buying. It's a big process. Now, in this process, obviously, what's happening is, as we've seen, the cruelty is they are killing the worms mm -hmm. like this. And there is somebody out there. Have you heard of this word called Ahimsa silk? Yes, yes, yes. So a man by the name of Kusuma Rajaya, he started this whole concept of Ahimsa silk. And his idea was that even he didn't like the fact that these um, worms are being killed like this. So he told, I will buy these cocoons. I'll keep them and wait till the moth comes out. Hmm. Once the moth flies away, I'll put the cocoons and I'll take the silk. That way the moth is not, I'm not killing it. Uh, but then once it makes the hole, then the so that's thread the point. or the fiber the, the, won't be... The reason why the standard silk industry will not follow this step is because when it makes a hole, obviously it cannot come as a single strand now. 
True. The quality is lost. Second thing is this moth will make a small red stain on the outside of the hole. Silk color also changes. So, but this man says this is ahimsa silk. So he's doing this. So people immediately ask us vegans like. Is ahimsa silk vegan? Can we wear this? That is what I was about to ask. And is it I, really vegan? No, it's not definitely, most definitely 100% not vegan. As I, I mentioned earlier, it's not about how we exploit them. Mm -hmm. It's not about if we let them live and take what's theirs. It's the fact that we use them at all. We shouldn't be doing it. Think of it one thing. Mm. Even if we didn't kill these silk moths, as we saw earlier, if I take those cocoons even after they've gone out, they still can't fly. They still can't eat. So either ways, they're gonna die. They're in gonna a few die. Days. But they, but they exist because you breed them. As you see in this, you, they, the only reason they even came to Earth is because for your selfish motive. Nothing else. Ahimsa silk is beneficial for the silk farmer, not the silk moth. Okay. So, okay. when you do an action that is beneficial for yourself and not the animal, how can there be ahimsa in that? So at least if you told me I am going to the forest and protecting these creatures, putting them there for their benefit. That could be ahimsa there. But I am exploiting them, but I won't kill them for my benefit. It doesn't make it any sense that, because the, we still run on a yes, motive behind it. The moment you use someone else for your benefit, that is, there is no more ahimsa in that. So I'll tell people, please don't fall for this ahimsa silk. Silk is filled with cruelty. To make one silk sari, 40,000 innocent silkworms had to be boiled. And the fact is that these days we have something called artificial silk, which is far cheaper which looks just as good, if not better, and that doesn't involve any cruelty to the silkworm. So why not just go for that? I'm not asking people to give this up and say like, oh, from now on, we're only cotton saris and go for all functions. No, we have the alternative available and ready in the market. True. And if you walk into any store, they have artificial silk these days. Yes. So all I'm saying to the audience is, why not make this change in your life? It's not that hard. So the silk industry is very cruel. Mm -hmm. Again, like the honey industry, we are exploiting these creatures. We are breeding them, like you said, and we should not be breeding them. We should not be using them. And these are two areas where we humans can actually stop it. I don't know about other areas we can stop or not. Mm -hmm. But these two areas is where we intentionally exploit them. This We, we can stop them. So why not stop? Okay, so yes. may it be honey or may it be silk, mm. it's just that the choice is in our hands. Right. We should just make the right choice right. because we have so many alternatives, we have right. so many options for it. So why not go for it? Correct. And speaking of alternative, I would like to give an alternative for honey as well to the audience because they may be wondering what do I eat instead of honey. Yes. Honey is used in pujas, in our food, in co cooking so many things. So I'm just saying why not use a date syrup instead. Wow. It's actually cheaper. It is just as sweet, adds a different flavor to it, and it's readily available. Like, I go to a supermarket, they literally have here one bottle of honey, mm -hmm. next to it a bottle of date syrup. Why can't I just pick the date syrup True. instead of the honey? True. I mean, the option is right in front of you, and it's cheaper. So, all I would say is, options are available. You know, this earth doesn't exist only for us. Let's try to be compassionate and expand that compassion to everybody and just not exploit anyone for our selfish motives and live vegan is all I would say. Okay, okay. That's a very nice way of putting it. So we have to live and we also need to give the right for others to equally live right. with us. So because we all are social beings, we need each one of them. Correct. Everybody is important to us. So since we have so many alternatives and available options are in plenty, we should definitely make use of it. Correct. So thank you, Arvind. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you again. Thank you so much. To give a lot of insights and inputs on veganism. Thank you. Thank you. So viewers, this was today's episode of Go Vegan. Hope to see you all soon with more such episodes. Namaste.